Again, uh, as Brother Paul mentioned, I will try and stop a little bit early so that we can have a few minutes for question and answers. If you would like to ask something in dealing with the subject that we've dealt with. Let me, and I will continue to keep these three as <clears throat> aspects before our minds in these lessons as to the principles relating to answering the questions as to whether an action from the medical field and the medical technology is moral or immoral. And that is the three principles, the sanctity of human life, <clears throat> that have the second, the honor, the dignity, and the respect of man. And then the third would be the, res the sacredness of the family unit. But we also discuss the aspect of intent because intent is really the deciding factor in many situations. Uh, some procedures, of course, would never be right in themselves, but some of them are basically what we could say neutral and they're right or wrong based upon the intent of the person. If the intent of the person violates these principles that we have noted, then it becomes immoral. Last week, we looked at the subject of abortion. And abortion is morally wrong. We should all realize that, and I think we do. There's two things that I wanted to discuss this afternoon, and the first of those is in vitro fertilization. The process of in vitro fertilization is that human eggs are fertilized in a, what's referred to as a test tube, a glass, glass dish. And then those fertilized eggs would be transferred to the female and then babies brought to term as a result of that. The intent, of course, of in vitro fertilization would be that here is a couple that cannot conceive a baby and so it is to help them accomplish that uh, purpose. They had not been able to previously and now then they will be able to through this process. The problem with this is that there are numerous additional fertilized eggs that are sacrificed. Now that's a nice way of putting they are aborted. And so you have the abortion of all of these other fertilized eggs, human babies at this point in time, that are just discarded and aborted because they are extra and you don't, they don't, are not needed. As a result of that, the process itself, at least as far as this time is concerned, must be rejected because of the abortion of the, all of these other human beings. But the question then comes, well, what if? Now there's these, all these what if questions. What if we then find a way in which to accomplish this which avoids the abortion of these other fertilized eggs. And let's face it, with the advances of medical technology, that might be accomplished. Then you get into some other areas, and here is a, a situation where intent plays a major role. Here is a married couple they want a baby. They have not been able to conceive on their own. They use this process, and again, this is in this what-if scenario that other fertilized eggs are not discarded and thus aborted. So they use this process in order to 
have a baby. Well, what would be wrong with that? In that situation, the intent of it is a family unit having a child. And you have thus the sacredness both of the human being and the sacredness of the family unit being preserved. But on the other hand, here's a woman said, I don't want a husband. You know, they're a bunch of no good for nothing anyway and uh, want to bypass that orderly design or to lesbians who decide we want a child and so they have this same process and do the same thing in order to accomplish having a baby outside of the marriage relationship. Then you have a situation where the sacredness of the family unit is being destroyed and bypassed and thus that action becomes immoral. The action itself of in vitro fertilization, if you could avoid the abortive nature of it, is neither moral nor immoral based upon itself. It would be the intent of the individuals who are engaged in it. If the intent is maintaining the sacredness of the family unit, then it would be a moral situation. However, if it is an attempt to bypass God's design for the home and the family, then it becomes immoral. But it's based upon the intent of the individuals who would be involved in it. But there is one other aspect that needs to be at least considered in this matter. And that is God has set forth a certain design as to how babies are going to be conceived. And the aspect of bypassing that God design method of conception. And we must be careful at least in bypassing that type of design that God has arranged. Now then, the subject of euthanasia. This is a very difficult discussion when you get into euthanasia. The former governor of Colorado, Richard Lamb, said, quote, and this was a, is a quote from 1984, to show the age of it. But quote, elderly people who are terminally ill have a duty to die and get out of the way, end quote. Now notice that. They have a duty to die and get out of the way. Now, while he actually voiced the statement, many others have basically stated the same thing, and that is the feeling of what many individuals hold. Many individuals who have thought that that would alleviate the high cost of health care I mean, let's face it, look at all of the money that is spent on the elderly as far as health care is concerned. As you get older, I'm sure none of y'all have ever experienced this, but as you get older, you seem to be needing to go to the doctor more often and you need more medication and those things that might not have bothered you when you were young, they seem to bother you when you're older and it's easier to break bones and this and that and this, it goes on and on. And that drives up the price of health care and it becomes a financial burden, not only upon the family, but also upon society itself. 
And so they have a duty to die and get out of the way. Many believe, I would be among that many, that a national health care system will accomplish this very thing. Look at Obamacare. There will be then the rationing of services, the rationing of medicine, rationing of surgeries, all in the attempt to save money, to save the cost. And if you don't think that that will happen, look at some of the nations that already have national health care systems. They do that very thing. You're too old to have this surgery. You don't need this medicine for you because your age, you're beyond the age of receiving health for that illness. And so they have a duty to die for, quote, the greater good, end quote. That's what you're dealing with when you're dealing with euthanasia, at least partially. The term euthanasia comes from two words. The first is eu, E-U, which means good. And then you have thanatos, which is the Greek word that means death. And thus, euthanasia means literally good death. Now, there are three categories of euthanasia. The first is voluntary euthanasia. This is when a patient consents to die. Willing to die, and he consents to it. The second is non-voluntary euthanasia. That is the death of an individual without his consent. The individual does not give their consent, uh, but someone else does. The third would be involuntary euthanasia. That is, it is conducted against the will of the patient. In Nazi Germany, and if you want to really get into a study of euthanasia, you, you need to really study what took place with the Nazis in Germany during that World War II time frame. Because that involved involuntary euthanasia and it ended up with the actual what we now refer to as the Holocaust but basically the Holocaust to, was involuntary euthanasia it's a, conducted against the will of the patient patient does not consent to it no one else consents to it now, in the non-voluntary euthanasia, you have, while the patient does not consent to it himself, someone else does. In that case, generally, the patient himself is not able to. He's uh, in a coma or some other type of problems where he does not have the capability of consent. But a family member or someone else consents for him. In involuntary, it's against the will of the person. They're going to be euthanized whether they want to be or not. That's Nazi Germany. Under euthanasia, there are two variations. The first of those would be passive euthanasia, and the second is active euthanasia. P 
passive euthanasia is simply allowing the patient to die by no longer receiving a medicine or receiving treatment or simply being removed from life support. That's generally referred to as passive euthanasia. Active euthanasia, on the other hand, is the use of lethal force or lethal substances to kill the patient. In active euthanasia, something is actually done to end the patient's life. You're doing something to him to end his life. That's the purpose of it. On the other hand, passive euthanasia is something is not done that would have preserved the patient's life. May I say withholding certain medication or certain life support uh, procedures or treatments, it's something not done as opposed to something that is actively done to end the life. And with passive, it's not done and thus the life is not preserved. Now there's some things that stand out or should at least stand out for the, the child of God and in our minds. The first of those is that man does not have the authority to decide to take life. Life comes from God. He is the giver and the author of life. And as we were looking at the uh, dignity and honor of man, we looked at uh, several passages dealing with that, but, so we won't go back over them. But since God is the giver of life, God is the one who thus determines who and when life may be terminated, not man. Now God has determined that man should take certain lives because of the evil of that individual. That's what capital punishment is all about. It's set forth for us from the very beginning almost uh, after the flood, Genesis and ninth chapter, that someone who takes life, their life should be taken. And so th that is the basis of capital punishment. In the law of Moses, you see many crimes that God sets forth in which they were to execute the individual. In the New Testament, it says that the government is to use that sword. Well, the sword was an instrument of death. And it, uh, thus, in using the sword, they are preserving good and doing away with evil. And so capital punishment has been set forth by God for certain individuals. Well, God has thus determined that that individual who commits certain crimes, their life should be forfeited. Their life should be terminated because of the actions that they engage in. But God is the one who determines these things, not man. man God does not give man the right to terminate life thus. Whether you're dealing with the taking of one's own life, suicide, is suicide right? Oh no, it's morally wrong. It is the taking of human life. And thus, suicide is wrong. God does not give the right to man to commit suicide. There are several ty uh, times in which suicide, not the word, but it describes the action of suicide is discussed within the Bible. It never is used in a positive way. It is always negative, always wrong. 
And so God doesn't give the right to terminate one's own life. Nor does God set forth the idea of terminating life because of suffering or pain. Many times with euthanasia, the, the idea is I, we're going to euthanize this person or this person desires to be euthanized because of the pain or the suffering that he's going to have to go through. God never gives man the right to terminate life upon that basis. Then there's also the question for the Christian, who says or who has the right to say that one life is more important than another life? Often in regards to euthanasia especially, and the quote that we started with in this, older people basically need to die and get out of the way. Who's to say that younger lives are more important than older lives? And in reality, what does the Bible say about the older ones? It teaches us to honor them. For example, just a couple of examples, Leviticus 19 and verse 32. Thou shalt rise up before the hoary head. Hoary head is simply someone who is gray-headed. So thou shalt rise up before the hoary head and honor the face of the old man and fear thy God, I am the Lord. Now euthanasia comes along and says, euthanize those older people. God says, honor them. Quite a difference, isn't there? In Ephesians 6 and verse 2 in relationship to children and their parents, honor thy father and mother which is the first commandment with promise. Instead of euthanizing them, we honor them. That's the teaching of the Bible in relationship to, to those who are older. I realize that's not popular in our society. As Lamb stated, those who basically are older, terminally ill, they need to die and get out of the way. We, within our society, for years, have glorified youth. The Bible, if you're using that phraseology, glorifies the older person, not youth. We've turned it around within our society. In Matthew, the 15th chapter, the Pharisees come to Jesus saying, Why are your disciples transgressing the commandments of the elders? Of the tradition of the elders and that they wash not their hands before they eat. And Jesus turns around, why are you transgressing the tradition of God or the commandments of God by your tradition? For, and he says, starting in verse 4, for God commanded, honor thy father and mother, and he that curseth father and mother, let him die the death. But ye say, whosoever shall say to his father or his mother, it is a gift where by, whether, by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, and honor not his father or his mother, he shall be free. Thus have you made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. They were saying, here's the, your parents. And you have the obligation given by God to take care of your parents. But you're saying... This money that I would have used to take care of you, I have dedicated it to God, and thus I cannot take that money and use it to take care of you. And you honor not, thus, your father or your mother. Now, he says, you transgress the commandments of God by your traditions. And he calls them hypocrites, tells them that their worship is vain, they honor God with their mouth, but their heart is far from them. Why? Because God says you respect your parents, you honor your parents, honor the older person. 
Then another thing that should stand out to the Christian. While euthanasia, the very meaning of the term is good death, the only good death from a biblical standpoint is that individual who dies as a faithful Christian. In St. Corinth- Timothy, the fourth chapter, is Paul is about to have his life ended, actually. He's about to be put to death. He says, starting in verse 7 and verse 8 of, of chapter 4, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give to me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them that love his appearing. I am about to die, but there is something good that's going to be the result of it. A crown of righteousness is going to be given to me. Why? Because I fought a good fight, I finished my course, I've kept the faith. John was instructed to write in Revelation 14 and verse 13. Write, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. What is it? A good death is one who dies in the Lord. That's the only good death that there is. There is no other good death from a biblical standpoint. Now then, well, let's consider some principles in relationship to all of these things that we've stated. There is nothing wrong with allowing the death process to take place. Death is something that's going to come upon all of us. There's nothing wrong in allowing that death process to take place not taking actions to artificially sustain one's existence is not wrong. There's nothing wrong with that. We are not required to submit ourselves or our loved ones to endless medical treatments in a futile effort to sustain physical life. Now then, we're not talking about someone who gets sick and has the chance of recovery. We're talking about someone who is dying. And to try to, well, you can do this and this and this, and you can artificially sustain that life instead of allowing the death process to take place, We do not have to do that. We can allow the death process to take place. However, it is morally wrong to actively do something to cause the death to take place, that which we described previously as active euthanasia. We do not have the right to do something that would cause the death of another individual under those circumstances. But to allow the death process to take place, yes, we can do that. Life is something that is precious as far as God is concerned. But spiritual life is far more important. And our spiritual obedience and that eternal life that's going to come. As we mentioned, in reality, the only good death is that death that is, takes place in the Lord. That one who has become a Christian and lived faithfully as a Christian. Because when he dies, he has the opportunity to go and be with the Lord. Philippians, the first chapter. If you've not obeyed the gospel, then we would encourage you to do that this afternoon. If you need to come back because you're not living that type of life to where you would die in the Lord, then why not come back, be restored, let us pray with you for the forgiveness of your sins so that you can, when death does come, it will be a good death. If you need to come, do so as we stand and sing the invitation song.